All right, I'd like to just take some time to answer some questions that we frequently get in our seminar. And so we have lots of, uh, lots of questions uh, that will come up from time to time. And I'd like to just take a few of those questions and just go over them with you to help you to help you to understand a little bit more about the inductive Bible study. Uh, again, inductive Bible study, it's a very simple way to study. And yet, you can, you can make it as complicated as you want. Now, I, I put together my course over the years to make it as simple as possible. A lot of times I'm working with pastors. Sometimes they've only got a fourth grade level education. And, and so how do you study when you've got a fourth grade level education? Well, it's going to be a little different than maybe somebody that's got a, a diploma from a university or a seminary. And, and you need to know how to, how, to, how to work. Well, the inductive system is real simple, and you don't have to make it complex. Some people have made it very complex. But uh, there are questions that come up. And so, you know, one of the questions that frequently comes up is, you know, what, what uh, for example, when I go through, how, what kind of a book do I start with? Do I start with a big one or a small one? The first time I've done this. And they, I think the answer is, that uh, you want to start with the shorter books to chart and to outline, and then uh, you'll find that th you'll learn the system a little bit better when you work with the shorter books. The epistles are really great, some of the shorter epistles. And then you can move to like uh, the New Testament books, like the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, the, those books. Matthew, um, Matthew is a little more complicated. Mark is probably one of the more simple Gospels to work with but you can go through and begin to outline it. And then part of one of the questions is, you know, how if, if it's a big book, how much am I going to outline? And, and, you know, like Genesis, if you're going to study through Genesis, you're going to outline the whole thing first. or No, you can take it in sections. And you don't have to go through the whole thing outlining it at first, but just start working sections with it. And then as you continue on, you develop more and more as you go. So you can just take it step by step. You don't have to do the whole thing at once. The shorter books, yes, you want to go through and break it apart and get the overall idea. And a lot of times people are asking, well, how, how, how many times if I, I'm working with a text, uh, how many times should I read it? Uh, well, you need to read it 35 times before you get into the study. No. <laughs> You're going to just simply read it to where you get the ideas yourself, you know. So when you feel like you're comfortable with it, then you go on to do your outlining and so forth. So you don't have to read and reread it, you know, a set number of times. Uh, another question that is asked is my chart, as I've done that three column chart. Uh, I find that I'm really good at application. And so I'll make an observation and then I'll make a whole bunch of applications. And at the end, my chart is heavy with application on the third column over here, but real light on the observation and really light on the interpretation. And so obviously what you're, you're really not working with the text very well there. And what you've got to do is you've got to, you should have more observations than anything else. And then your interpretations, you're going to have a lot of insight. Applications, you will have a, a variety of applications there. But, but actually, your observation is really key to inductive Bible study. You've got to get the ideas. Once you get the ideas, then we're going to draw our interpretations. And, and then we will move to application. But, but uh, if your chart is overloaded with applications, then obviously you're not really getting the idea and it's critical that you get the observation first, and then you're going to move to the second step, interpretation, explaining the meaning, and then application. One of the questions that frequently comes up about interpretation. Now, uh, a lot of people get afraid almost to do anything with the middle column in your chart, you know, because I, I don't want to misinterpret. And, and what I want to say to you, don't be afraid of interpreting a text but if you're not sure, then you can check yourself if you've got some resources to, to work with. And, and, and so what I do is, you know, I'm going to interpret it the best of my ability as I work with the context. And, and again, 
the most important part of your interpretation has got to come from the context. And once that context is not quite clear, then I am going to do some cross-referencing or I'm going to go to other scriptures. But, uh, you know, people ask a lot about if, if I should, when I get that interpretation column now, I need to have my commentaries out here. Well, I want to say this. Now, I am not a real big commentary fan because I don't think you have to have a commentary to interpret the Bible. Now, there are obviously some issues that are going to be complicated at times, and so I'm not saying that commentaries are, are, are bad. I, I think they can be a, a wonderful help, uh, but having, first of all, the right kind of commentary is very important. Uh, somebody that is going to work with the text uh, uh, and interpret it correctly I want to look at somebody that I can really trust that has worked well with that, that information. Now, people ask me all the time, you know, what kind of commentaries should I use? And uh, I, again, I'm not an expert on commentaries by any means, but the ones that I particularly like, and, and every pastor is going to ha have certain ones that they like better than others, but the, the ones that I use are Bible knowledge commentary put out by Dallas Theological Seminary. It's, it's very solid, very, very uh, fundamental. And so I really like what they, uh, how they interpret the scriptures. And they, they've often been a big help to me when I'm in my interpretation column. And I've noted it. And, and again, what I do is I just note an interpretation that I've made. And I wait until I've finished my study. I never go to the commentary in the middle of my study. I wait until I go the, through the whole study and then I've noted certain things that i got a question about, and then I'm going to come back to it. Because what you'll find sometimes as you're going through the text, once you work through the whole text, often the text is going to answer itself. It's going to give you the answer. And so that's why I want to stay in the context as long as possible before I go outside either to other scriptures or to commentaries. But uh, Bible knowledge commentary is an excellent study. Uh, Warren Wisby is, is very good. I really like a lot of his stuff. I think he's very solid. Of course, Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, has a wonderful uh, through the Bible interpretations, and there, he's very solid. Uh, J. Vernon McGee is one of my favorites. Uh, I like him, and it's been amazing. He's been dead for many, many years, and yet you can still hear him on the radio every day. And I love to listen to him. He has just some wonderful insights. And though the, his recordings were multiple years ago, almost in a totally different culture than it is today, uh, it's so relevant. And it just shows you how relevant the Bible is. And so Jay Vernon is uh, one of my favorites. I, I really enjoy Pastor Ray Stedman. He's no longer alive, but he came from Peninsula Bible Church. He's a Dallas uh, graduate. He was a very solid expositor, has some wonderful stuff, so I really enjoy his teachings. Uh, another book that I found very helpful in my study is Haley's Bible Handbook. And Haley's is, just gives you a lot of insights, that, uh, that uh, cultural information, background, history, and so forth. And so it, it's, it's a, a, just a valuable little tool to use when you're working with your, your studies. So those are some of the some of the things that I will work with as I'm, uh, as far as commentaries go, to help me to draw interpretations. But don't be afraid to interpret. I'm not always going to be right. But what I am, I must do is ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to interpret this correctly. The Bible is very clear that the Holy Spirit really is the only teacher we need. And as I stay open to Him, then I'm going to be able to understand uh, the, the scriptures more and more as he enlightens me. And many times I have been working with a text and, I, and I'd be, even be in the middle of teaching it. And all of a sudden, as I'm teaching it, the Holy Spirit enlightens me. He shows me something I didn't ever see before. And boy, I get really excited when that happens. But, uh, but, but again, rely upon the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I want to be open. If you become dogmatic, if you look at a text and say this is the only way you can, you can work with it, then you, you can 
uh, obviously be misled and make some wrong interpretations. So again, don't be afraid to interpret. Write down what you feel like the text is saying, and then you can always check yourself if you have some of those resources. Now, again, I work with pastors in third world countries. Sometimes they have no resources available other than just a Bible, a translation. And so, again, you can learn to study without commentaries, and that's what I encourage people to do. Don't use the commentary until the very end if you want to. When I first started in ministry, I would get my Bible study, you know, get my Bible open, and I'd read my text, and I'd immediately, I laid out actually five commentaries. So I had a nice big table, and I've got one commentary here, second commentary. And so I would read the text, and I immediately would go to the commentary and see what this guy had to say. And then I'd read the second guy and see what he had to say. I'd read the third guy and so forth. Well, by the time I got through with all five commentaries, you know, I was more confused than anything else. And so again, they are not the answer. You're looking at the text through inductive Bible study is the best way to study a text. Make sure you observe it carefully. Remember, you've got to look and keep looking. And then you've got interpretations. And then you're going to make applications. And, and so that's the most, I believe, the most effective way to get into Scripture and work with it. Other questions that we have I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a teacher, so should I use inductive Bible study, tra- uh, that, that charting system? And I say, my answer is yes, uh, even if you're not teaching. This is just a great way to study personally. And this is the way I study the Word personally all the time, is I'm always observing, interpreting, and applying as I work with a text. It's just so ingrained into me. Now, one of the things I, I warn you as you get into this kind of study I will ruin the way you read the Bible because you're not going to read it the same way once you learn this system. It's going to slow you down and it's going to get you to learn to really observe, interpret, and apply. And that's what we want. All right. Another question that is frequently asked um, is, does it get easier? this inductive Bible study, the more I, I, I use it? And the answer is yes. You know, it's just like any other tool. You have to learn how to use the tool. And once you become familiar with it, you know, then you're going to get better and better at it. It's kind of like with my phone, my cell phone. You know, I, I had this, uh, this one kind of cell phone, and, and man, I tell you, it was driving me nuts. I couldn't figure out how it worked, you know, and then I had to get my grandson in there to help me, you know, because the younger generation, you know, they're born with one of these things on their, uh, come out with a, a cell phone in their hands, you know, and they know everything about it, you know, they pick it up so quick, but I'm a little bit older, so a little bit slower, so I get my kids and I get my grandkids to kind of help me work through, but but those apps uh, on your phone can, you know, it takes time to learn how to do it, and so again, uh, with any tool, it's just going to take you time to learn how to Uh, study this way, but the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. And that's why I encourage people, instead of, in your quiet time, your devotion time, instead of just reading a text, uh, it's good to do that. And I have a reading program where I read through the Bible every year. I'm going to, I'm reading constantly through my scriptures. And uh, so I'm reading fairly fast for that. But, but when it comes time to do a little study of a, of a a section, I'm going to take time to, to, to really slow down and look at it. And, uh, and so this whole system will slow you down and help you to just kind of look at it carefully, interpret, and then apply it. All right, what's, uh, what's another question here? Let's see. All right, do you have any more resources on your website? And, and the answer is yes. We do have a lot of resources on our website. If you'll go to our website, which is www.icmbible.com, you will find uh, the resources. You can download uh, our, uh, our DVD online. We have uh, the manual online. And we have some other resources available that you can, you can check out. So I encourage you to do that. 
Uh, one of the resources that that uh, you know you can get you know on your cell phone you can get all these different apps today, but uh, there's some wonderful little apps. For example, like the Blue Letter Bible app is a wonderful uh, tool, and a lot of these guys that I mentioned, the commentaries that that I like, you'll find on Blue Letter Bible. It's a it's a wonderful little tool that you can download, and when you get to a section of scripture and you don't quite get it, you just touch your app. And, and your phone and the app will bring up a commentary and you begin to work with the commentary. So, I mean, we have so many tools today that we didn't have years ago. Now, I, uh, I remember my, in my last pastorate that I was in, I had a library and it, it covered a whole wall. And I had commentaries, all kinds of books and resources, and it covered a whole wall. Well, my cell phone today has all those resources plus more. And it's amazing today how the technology has advanced. So we do have resources available to us readily. And, and so, uh, yes, uh, online we do have a, a number of stuff. People ask, uh, can they follow us in our ministry uh, online? And, or do we have uh, newsletters? Yes, we have a, a newsletter that we send out periodically talking about our work. Uh, if you really want to follow us, we, uh, we ask you to get on our prayer list because on our prayer list, I will tell you where I'm going and I will tell you what specifically to pray for. And then at the end of that, we, we will give a report. I often will send pictures and anybody on our prayer list will, uh, will get uh, the report of what has happened and so forth. And I will even, uh, uh, on the... Uh, social media like Facebook, for example, we I will post things. We have a site there, and I will post things from time to time. Uh, but when I go into countries like Iraq, I have to be very careful what I say. And so I don't usually post a lot on Facebook because ISIS is on Facebook too. And so I, I'm going to be very careful what I will say or where I go. So a lot of times I don't put anything on social media when I'm going into like Iraq or Pakistan, some of these countries where... There's a lot of problems, but uh, I do a post a lot, and you can pick up, you know, what what is happening. And if you're on our newsletter, then we can we'll send you that information. You can pray for us, and we really do appreciate it very very much. But you'll also get the reports, and there's some really exciting stories that we share, and just a lot of really neat things that are happening. So anyway, that is available online for you, and. Okay, uh, one of the questions that frequently is asked is, what kind of Bible should I use? You know, there's so many versions today. Uh, I highly recommend some of these uh, top versions over uh, some of the versions that maybe are a little more literal uh, in their translation. For example, uh, uh, if you if you use like the RSV Revised uh, Standard Version, it, it's it's uh, it's a pretty good translation, uh, but sometimes it, it's it's gonna it's gonna give a more uh, not so much a literal translation, but it's more readable. the The NIV uh, New International Version, a lot of people are using it. It's a it's a good it's a good Bible, but I don't think it's the best one to study because it's it's more of a it, it re, it's a reading version, kind of helps you to read the, uh, the, the story or, or the, the text. And, it, and, and so if you really want an accurate version, you know, from the original manuscripts, it's going to be more word for word. You, got, you want to use versions like from the King James Version. They use the, this older manuscript that is very, very reliable. New King James, I, I prefer because the old King James uses a lot of Old English that is kind of a little difficult to understand, so you almost need a common uh, dictionary just to in interpret some of the words. But the New King James is a very good uh, version. I I like that very much. Uh, one of the most literal versions of our our Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek is the New American Standard. It's a very good study Bible. Highly recommend it. 
Uh, I grew up with it. Uh, there's some newer versions that have come out, like the ESV, the English Standard Version. It's, it's a very good translation. I, I like it. I've been using it, learning a little bit more about it. And so uh, those are some of the versions that, that I, I highly recommend. Again, I'm not an expert on all the versions by any means, but uh, those are some of the ones that I know are more, a little more accurate. Again, uh, when you're using some of your, you know, like uh, your versions that are very readable versions, uh, the Living Bible, you know, it just, it's, it's great for reading, but it's really not the best for studying. And so I want to try to get the more, um, more word-for-word translations from the original Hebrew and the, and, and the Greek. Now, most of us don't know how to study the Greek. We've never learned the Greek or the Hebrew and so forth. And, and so if you don't know them, one of the things that's very helpful is to take the different translations and see how they translate it from those languages. And so I like to use two or three versions as I work with the text so that it, I, I'm going to get the idea. These are scholars that have worked with the text with, uh, with, uh, from the Hebrew and from the Greek. And so their translations, uh, especially from these uh, versions that I had mentioned that I think are more accurate, you're going to find an, an accurate interpretation of those words. Now, again, you're welcome to use the Greek lexicons and, you know, there's... There's uh, uh, versions that are available to you that can take you into the Hebrew and the Greek, and you can look them up. But again, if you use just, the, just the, some of the different translations, you're going to get enough of an idea to understand what the text is saying without understanding the Greek or the Hebrew. And so uh, I, I do that. Now, you know, a lot of pastors, they will say, well, the Greek word says this, and the Hebrew word says this, and so forth. And you can do that, and you can do word studies, and there's Certainly nothing wrong with that, you know, but I don't find that that's, you know, most people could care less what the Greek says, you know, and, and, and really what you want to do is when you take them through the study, I avoid doing a lot of that, you know, using, okay, the Greek word here, the Hebrew word here. Sometimes it's very helpful, you know, but, but I don't want to do too much of that. Let the translation that I'm working with explain, it, it's clear enough there, and I don't need to often go into that much detail with uh, particular words. And you can really lose people real quick if you're ministering to them and you just start, you know, going into the Hebrew and the Greek and, and it's like, you know, it's, it's a little, uh, little too much. So I encourage you to be careful about that. Uh, one other thing I'd like to talk about is with, with your chart. Now, you'll notice in your, in your manuals you have several pages for charting. A lot of times what people will do is, is they will take the text and they write so small and they'll get everything on the first page. But you'll, if you notice in your manual, it's got several pages to chart on. And then, of course, you can draw your own charts. And I encourage people to uh, put a, a chart together with their uh, laptop, their computers. You can, you can uh, uh, draw up a three-column chart. And if you don't know how to do that, you can go on our website and download the chart that we have uh, available there. And you can chart on your computer, which is really, uh, you know, Handwriting has become obsolete today. You know, people are much more into this than they are handwriting. And, and so we do have that available. But in your charts, make sure you leave yourself plenty of space. You make your observation. But your interpretation, you know, there, you need to have plenty of room on that to write out all the things that you want to say about that interpretation as you're explaining the meaning there. And then give yourself plenty of room for the application. So... You can easily chart a number of pages, you know, like, for example, when I gave my assignment to my, some Russian students when I was doing a seminar in Russia, uh, I, I said, okay, now go home and I want you to chart the book of Jude. And they came back with 18 to 20 pages uh, of the book of Jude. That's 25 verses, folks, but they broke it apart in tremendous amount of detail. And there's so much there, but they had a whole bunch of pages and and so really, when you're charting, you know, don't, make sure you get, just give yourself plenty of room to break the text apart, okay?